are four characters in the theatrical absurdist triumph that is Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Estragon, along with his close companion and frequent partner in bickering, Vladimir, are essentially everymen, representing all of humanity. But the two men also contrast in some ways. Sometimes Vladimir calls Estragon Gogo. Estragon is primarily concerned with feelings, particularly his own suffering, rather than intellectual thoughts, and he has trouble understanding much of Vladimir's logic and philosophy. He displays intuitive leaps that go deeper than Vladimir does with his logic. If the two primary characters represent two parts of a person, Estragon is the body, possibly represented by his fixation with his boots. The beatings Estragon says he receives represent the suffering that afflicts and traps humanity, though Estragon's complaints about it are self-pitying, and the fear of another beating keeps him locked in the endless waiting that comprises the play's action. Vladimir is the more logical and intellectual of the two primary characters, and he's the only character in the play who remembers most events from one day to another. He works to fit these events into a logical time frame, despite conflicting evidence. And although he tries to explore philosophical ideas logically, he often misses deeper truths that his friend Estragon, who sometimes refers to him as Dee Dee, seems to grasp instinctively. Occasionally searching his hat, which he wears on his, you guessed it, head, he represents the mind with all its ability to deceive itself, if Estragon represents the body. Pozzo is a wealthy landowner with power and resources, and he sees Vladimir and Estragon as beneath him, but condescends to talk with them anyway. Mostly, he just likes the sound of his own voice. His concern with appearances and social conventions is ridiculous, pointing out their meaninglessness. Pozzo uses his power over his leashed slave Lucky to abuse him, but his power and resources are ultimately useless. They don't give his life meaning or protect him from misfortune, which shows up in the form of his becoming blind. Then, he must rely on Lucky, who was previously merely a convenience and used for entertainment, to help him navigate life, becoming a pitiful character in a single stroke of suddenly changed fate. Lucky, as Pozzo's slave, must constantly carry burdens that are not his own. His body is constrained, much like his free will, as he wears a rope around his neck that Pozzo holds onto like a leash as he whips him. This might be why he seems not even to consider leaving when Pozzo becomes blind, losing most of the power he had wielded over Lucky. But Lucky demonstrates some bizarre willpower during his long speech in Act 1, and he's upset by the prospect of Pozzo selling him, which suggests he may choose to willingly remain in his subservient role. There's a dependency between Lucky and Pozzo that seems related to, but isn't limited to, their inequality. 